Um, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Julie Cantor. She's a lifespan hematologist specializing in sickle cell disease. She works on the development of novel therapeutics in sickle cell disease, including gene therapies. And she's, she's very committed to improving outcomes in sickle cell disease, and she works closely with national partners, including the American Society of Hematology and the NIH, on both advocacy and research. Thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers for having me today. Um, I'm going to start off with a couple of disclosures. The first is that as we talk about endpoints, you should know that almost a year ago, the American Society of Hematology and the FDA gathered for a three-day workshop to determine endpoints in sickle cell disease and um, didn't determine them yet. So what I can tell you in 13 minutes might not be sufficient. Uh, but I am going to do my best. Um, I will consult for almost anyone who wants to develop a new drug in sickle cell disease, at least initially. If I think your science is good, I'll talk to you again. Um, but that really won't relate to anything I'm going to talk about today, with the exception of I have received honorarium to travel for Bluebird Bio, and I am going to present some of that data today. So I thankfully don't have to tell you much about sickle cell or its pathophysiology, thanks to Drs. Tisdale and Fitzhugh, who already told you. I am going to tell you slightly about the current therapies in sickle cell disease. It's very quick. We have very few. Challenges and barriers are great, and defining the endpoints remain very difficult. So sickle cell disease, as you already heard, is a point mutation that results in the production of an abnormal protein, the sickle hemoglobin does not behave normally. It actually turns on itself and then polymerizes, resulting in all kinds of different complications, including anemia, hemolysis, or the breakdown of red cells. It damages the inside of the vasculature, causes sterile inflammation, and long-term endothelial dysfunction and vasoocclusion. However, while we know that there's this single gene mutation responsible, there is a huge amount of phenotypic diversity that's not necessarily accounted for by hemoglobin genotypes. In fact, at times, if you've seen one individual with sickle cell disease, you've seen one individual with sickle cell disease. So there's other genetic polymorphisms and differences that we don't completely understand at this time. And while clinical patterns exist, each individual with sickle cell disease is very unique and may have a unique clinical course. Pain really remains our hallmark feature of this disease. It's the primary reason that individuals with sickle cell disease will encounter medical specialists. That pain is at least initially ischemic. It's secondary to vasoocclusion or blockage of blood flow in the small blood vessels. And it really is present throughout life and is one of the very few conditions in which you start with pain early and it continues throughout life. The biggest problem, however, is not just pain, but mortality. And what you can see on this graph is that while we've significantly improved childhood mortality, we have not made a great difference in adult mortality. And in fact, in California and Georgia, where we have our absolute best surveillance data, we can see average lifespans of only 43 and 41. And if you look at those colors on that graph as well, you can see that we're not actually moving in the right direction in terms of some of that mortality. So our young adults continue to die too young. However, the complications in sickle cell disease far exceed just pain. And in fact, every organ in the body is affected, including teeth, which nobody really think about, because blood flows everywhere, and anywhere that blood doesn't flow is going to be affected by sickle cell disease. So let's talk about the current therapies. I mentioned very few. One of the biggest problems that we have in sickle cell disease is minimal overall data. We do not have a national registry. There are over 100,000 affected individuals in this country alone, and yet we are lacking in a national registry. That makes things like natural history studies very difficult. It also makes determining optimal endpoints very difficult. Hydroxyurea was the first approved therapy, and it clearly modifies the course of sickle cell disease, specifically those who inherit sickle cell anemia or homozygous sickle cell disease. Decreases, decreases the frequency of pain for sickle cell anemia. However, it's not universally accepted. It's a chemotherapeutic. It is not originally developed for individuals with sickle cell disease, something that is very upsetting to them. It has a host of its own side effects and requires frequent monitoring. L-glutamine is the most recently approved, and it is anti-inflammatory, but right now we really don't know long-term impacts of L-glutamine. Blood transfusions have been demonstrated over the course of many, many studies to demonstrate significant improvement, specifically in stroke risk. It can actually decrease not just the prevention of primary stroke in at-risk individuals, but secondary stroke as well. It also can decrease unwanted acute chest syndrome, which is sickling in the lungs when it's been recurrent. 
However, there's multiple complications and there's just not enough blood that matches appropriately to treat every individual with sickle cell disease. And we have palliative management that's mostly pain management and opioids, which of course come with their own host of complications. So what about stem cell transplant? You've already gotten the best overview you could from Dr. Fitzhugh earlier today. We know that stem cell transplant is a cure in sickle cell disease and that the outcomes can be pretty awesome, especially for our children with matched related donors. And risk versus benefit considerations are improving for our affected adults. Early studies remain optimistic for improved outcomes and improved quality of life. However, as you can also see, not everyone has a good enough match. There is still a risk that's not small of graft versus host disease, though getting smaller. Immune suppressive medication can be long-term, and there's an ongoing risk of late rejection, among other problems. So what about gene therapy? It would certainly circumvent the need for finding a matched donor. We really talk about two different types of gene therapy in sickle cell disease. There's gene addition therapy, or the addition of a new gene. This, of course, doesn't remove or change any of the existing genes. And then there's gene editing, in which we can edit a gene that's already in the body, or we can add a new gene in homologous directed recombination. When we think about endpoints, we also have to think about which of these gene therapies we're doing. When we look at previous trials, and this is a great lesson in why good trials fail, Vasoclusive crises and pain severity have been the primary outcome used. What does that mean? That means that we're constantly assessing the pain that individuals have during an acute crisis or daily through a pain journal, asking patients one to 10, what's their pain today, asking their intensity and severity. As you can imagine, the pain is the problem is that pain is subjective. It has multiple causes and it can be very difficult to differentiate acute nociceptive pain and ischemic pain versus chronic pain. So as I like to say, are you having a pain crisis in your hip or did you go to the mall and walk for six hours while you were shopping yesterday pain in your hip? And it can be very different, difficult for even individuals who are affected to sometimes tell you which one is going on, which can make targeted therapy more complicated. Biologic endpoints. Well, we don't actually have any surrogate or validated biologic endpoints in sickle cell disease. The closest that we have is transcranial Doppler velocity. What's that? It is the measure of blood flow through the brain and it can identify individuals at high risk of stroke. And all we know about TCD velocity is that those individuals that have a very high, greater than 200 flow rate are at high risk of stroke. We know that that's not normal and there's a whole range of individuals who go between normal, which is below 140, and abnormal, which is 200. We know nothing about those middle ranges. We've defined the close to abnormal but not normal as conditional, but conditional doesn't actually correspond to any biologic endpoint, surrogate endpoint, or clinical endpoint. Proteinuria is a clear marker of renal dysfunction, but we don't know that if we alter proteinuria that we can change the outcome of renal dysfunction. So while we know it can predict who may have renal failure, changing it may not actually alter the course for that individual. TR jet velocity has been proven to be a huge risk factor in identifying especially adults at risk of early mortality. Again, however, it is a multifactorial measurement and changing that TR jet velocity may not change your clinical outcome. Pulmonary hypertension falls right up there with TR jet velocity and DLCO or diffusion lung capacity also can identify those individuals at high risk for severe lung disease or poor outcomes, but changing that may or may not change their overall disease course. So predictors of disease severity, we really don't have any. We can't identify when an individual is born with sickle cell disease, what type of sickle cell will they have? Will it be severe? Will they have frequent pain crises? Will they be in the hospital a lot? Or will they be very well and not even manifest much disease until 21 years of age? And so it's very hard to predict or use disease modifiers in that scenario. We know from early studies that fetal hemoglobin, as mentioned by Dr. Tisdale earlier, may predict individuals who have an easier course. Unfortunately, all of that data is derived from the cooperative study of sickle cell disease, or at least the majority of it. And in that study, many of those patients did not live long into adulthood. So now we see many adults with persistent fetal hemoglobin who have all of the same complications just 10 or 20 years later. So fetal hemoglobin might not be as predictive as we thought it could be other than protection in the early years. Total hemoglobin does seem to correlate with some of the specific disease mortality items such as renal dysfunction and stroke. However, we don't know that altering your total hemoglobin prior to the manifestation of these will actually change your course. 
The same can be true for white blood cell count, which can be used as a marker of inflammation, but not necessarily a marker of disease predictiveness. So what about endpoints then for gene therapy? Well, the blank screen was probably more accurate. However, outcomes of stem cell transplant have demonstrated something very important. They have told us that sufficient engraftment of donor stem cells leads to curative therapy. That is a true biologic marker. Long term, that does equal a resolution of vasoclusive pain crisis, a significant decrease or absent <coughs> risk of stroke, a stabilization of end organ dysfunction. <coughs> Outcomes achieved through a sufficient myeloid engraftment, about 20% as shown earlier, yield a stab stable hemoglobin production, and that's a stable production of non-sickle hemoglobin. Mixed chimerism, meaning you have part recipient and part donor, is acceptable, but that resulting normal hemoglobin or hemoglobin A has to exist more than hemoglobin S. So how do we measure gene therapy along the way? We talk a lot about vector copy numbers. What is that? Well, a very well-known hematologist came up to me the other day and said, could you please speak English when you present, because us normal hematologists don't know what a VCN is. That's an average number of gene therapy letters or vectors delivered to each sample of cells. And then, of course, we want to know how many of the cells were actually transduced, how many of those cells received to the vector, and what are the cell dose. That's the amount of the patient's own blood stem cells returned to the patient. These are the things we want to teach our individuals with sickle cells so they can begin to compare and contrast the different therapies that are out there. The other thing that's very important, and this is from work done in collaboration with Bluebird Bio, is trying to assess whether the hemoglobin in each cell is the same. So most of us who have normal hemoglobin AA, all of our cells have AA. We look like those orange dots all the way to the left, those orange cells. If you have sickle cell disease, all of your cells pretty much contain SS if you have two copies of S. If you have trait, every red cell has A and S in it. That is what prevents that cell from sickling, and it's what differentiates it from someone with transfusions who would have some normal cells from transfused blood and some sickled cells of their own. What we need to achieve when we talk about gene therapy is that pancellular expression so that when patients receive gene therapy, in this case we're talking about lentiglobin from Bluebird Bio, you're seeing that each cell contains both the lentiglobin cells as, or the lentiglobin-derived T87Q hemoglobin <laughs> in addition to the sickle hemoglobin, so that they manifest more like someone with sickle cell disease trait. When we look at the improvements that Bluebird Bio has made along the way, you can see changes from our original group A, in which we had very low vector copy numbers, and that correlated overall with low numbers of transduced cells, and we also had low CD34 doses, to improvement as we've gone along, to where now, as you can see in our group C, they have higher vector copy numbers, higher transduced cells, and better CD34 doses. What we also know is that that correlates very well with what the hemoglobin those cells now produce is. So as you can see along the way, vector copy number, which are here, and you can see the difference in group A and those from group C, predict hemoglobin production. So it's another good surrogate predictor. We can tell from this vector copy number how much novel therapeutic hemoglobin is going to be made. So the newer edited gene has to make that healthy hemoglobin. We have to know how much hemoglobin that new gene is making, if it's stable, and how it's packaged. This is just looking over time at that new hemoglobin production. Again, the sickle hemoglobin is in green, and you can see over time the pink, which is the T87Q, healthy hemoglobin or protein product is improving over time because it's outliving those sickled hemoglobin cells. So endpoints. We can translate these stem cell therapies to gene therapy. We know that sufficient vector copy number and transduction efficiency or editing efficiency can result in normal hemoglobin <laughs> production. We know that pancellular expression is necessary. If individuals produce two types of cells, the cells with all sickle hemoglobin will continue to sickle and manifest the same problems. <laughs> we know that individuals who have a pancellular expression will have a resolution or near resolution of hemolysis or red cell breakdown. And the rheologic properties, or the way that the blood flows, will look like those individuals with trait if they manifest as a pancellular expression. Outcomes in studies with production of fetal hemoglobin are less well-defined because we don't have quite the biologic, marker, the biologic model that we do in stem cell transplant, because when we transplant somebody with stem cells, we're not transplanting them with fetal hemoglobin. Long-term, we need to know that resolution of pain crisis occurs, 
that there's a decrease in stroke risk and a stabilization of organ function in gene therapy, just as we see in transplant. Safety concerns, don't have time to go through them, but both gene therapy and gene editing com come, of course, with their own risk of safety concerns that have to be evaluated and compared in risk, and risk versus benefits. We have to have stopping points. At what point is a gene editing therapy not to be taken further because it's not showing promise? When is poor protein expression going to be grounds for stopping an investigation? Finally, we have to define our success, ensure successful therapy is approved by the FDA and other monitoring communities. We have to monitor long-term to make sure that this manifests long-term and figure out how to make it available, affordable, and universal.